Heracles, or Hercules as the Romans in the modern western world would later call him, the greatest of the Greek and Roman heroes. He claimed to be the son of a mortal and a god. He said to have performed wondrous feats, and he said that after his death he would ascend to the heavens to join his father. Now, these are some pretty bold claims. There are several ways to consider Hercules. One possibility is that Hercules didn't do these things, but he really thought he did. If that's the case, he's insane. A second possibility is that he didn't do these things, and he knew he didn't. But a third possibility is that he really did do these things. Therefore, he really was the son of the most powerful god. So you need to make a choice among three things. Hercules was either a fibber, a fruitcake, or a frickin' god. There's a whole series of arguments by followers of Hercules that use various texts and stories I won't get into to show you that Hercules was neither a fibber nor a fruitcake. Therefore, Hercules is a frickin' god. Christians and atheists watching this right now are in total agreement. This logic is this. It's incomplete, right? The problem lies in the first premise. Obviously, those can't be the only three possibilities. Hey, maybe Hercules didn't exist. Let's replace Hercules with another person born of a mortal with a god as a father. This argument, referred to as liar, lunatic, or lord, was first made popular by Christian apologist C.S. Lewis, the guy who wrote the Chronicles of Narnia. The poor man, the Lord of the Rings. His liar, lunatic, or lord trilemma is the response when people say that Jesus was a great moral teacher, but not the Son of God. They make this the first premise, and then through a series of arguments, they say Jesus was neither a liar nor a lunatic, therefore Jesus is Lord. Christians love to set up these false boundaries in point number one, and then they draw you in and argue the hell out of the second premise, but I don't even want to go that far. The first premise fails for Jesus just like it fails for Hercules. These are not the only three possibilities, and I don't want to even argue that Jesus did not exist. I want to argue here that there's another cute and catchy little L word to add to this choice. And like always, I want to use the Bible to make my point. Hercules actually was worshipped at one time, and Christians worked really hard to discredit that. They didn't have YouTube, but they did have Praeporatio Evangelica, a work attempting to prove the excellence of Christianity over pagan religions. They discredited Hercules by saying that uh, Heracles' worship came about because of a historical figure who attained cult status after he died. Evidently, there really was a guy named Heracles or something similar who ruled the city of Argos. He must have been a decent guy, and his followers just got a little out of hand, and they made him out to be more than he really was. That's called legend, and it starts with the letter L, so I'm going to plug it into the cute little Jesus equation. Now what is a legend? It's a story that is set in reality, but contains exceptional events that serve to reaffirm commonly held values of a particular group. Now let me be crystal clear. A legend is not always something just totally made up but it can be based on a real person and then the stories grow as time goes by. Some examples are Vlad Tepesh, who became Vlad the Impaler and then Dracula. And then there's William Wallace, who became a Jew-hating drunk. You should just fucking smile and blow me! Seriously though, this evolution is exactly what happens with Jesus in the New Testament. Now, the New Testament is not a novel with a series of chapters written by the same person. It's a collection of different books written at different times by various authors living in different countries, maybe even different languages. Today, it generally consists of 27 of those books. The entire collection of the New Testament was written between 50 AD and 150 AD. Wait a minute, did you catch that? 50 AD. If Jesus was born in the years around the BC to AD switch, and he lived for about 30 years, First grade math tells us we have at least a 20 year gap from Jesus' death and the first books we have about him. 20 years. That's like us now only starting to write about Vanilla Ice. Go ninja, go ninja, go! Go ninja, go ninja, go! Go ninja, go ninja, go! Go, 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 go! And the books of the New Testament are not all about Jesus and his time on earth. 
In fact, only a small handful even talk about his miracles. The timing of those become important later. We just can't read the New Testament books in order of their appearance in the Bible because they're out of order. We need to consider them chronologically from the dates they were written. We begin with a guy named Saul, and he was the one getting Christianity to grow. He's the reason there's Christianity today. On the road to Damascus, Saul had his divine epiphany and he changed his name to Paul and he started preaching. His letters to various churches in the region are the oldest books of the New Testament. These letters are intended to give instruction to the growing churches on Christian doctrine. It's also the first time we hear about Jesus. So what do you think should be included in these letters? Just 20 years away from the final epic years in the life of Jesus, wouldn't you think that these early writings would talk at least some about his miracles and his resurrection and his virgin mother? Where to your mother? They don't. Not once like you'd think. It's all very vague. Paul's first letters are 1st and 2nd Thessalonians in 52 and 53 AD. It's a pep talk about how to persevere through Roman rule and persecution. And then we go through Corinthians and Galatians and Philippians and we get all these verses that you hear at weddings. Again, no stories about Jesus. So from 52 AD for approximately the next 20 years, we have these letters from Paul and others that were read out loud to churches. They cited Jesus' teachings, and he's referred to as the Son of God who died for us, but the specifics are slim. The closest we come to hearing about Jesus' miracles during this time come in verses like this one from the book of Acts, written around AD 64, which is 34 years after Jesus. See, it's all vague. Nothing like what is coming down the pipe. It's not until nearly 40 years after Jesus' death that we get the first gospel mark. Mark was written between 68 and 73 AD. Now the story of Jesus starts cranking up. Pull me up! The story starts with Jesus already in his upper 20s. He first turns water into wine and from there the miracles start to rain down. But by comparison with the other gospels, Mark is pretty reserved. While it does have a number of miracles, we don't have the all-important resurrection. In fact, Mark originally ended when the women left the empty tomb. We don't see Jesus coming back and we don't see him ascending to heaven. It's just a cliffhanger ending. About 10 to 15 years after Mark, we get Matthew and Luke. These books were probably being written around the same time, but they weren't likely to have been aware of each other. They both were heavily inspired by Mark, and they copy a lot of stories from Mark, and another lost document simply referred to as Q. But here's the kicker. Matthew and Luke make the Jesus story even more supernatural than Mark did a decade earlier. Together, they add nearly 10 miracles that Mark didn't report. Matthew adds 3, and Luke adds 7. Matthew also has that crazy scene with the zombies. Both Matthew and Luke also introduce the story of Jesus' birth and his virgin mother. These two also give us the resurrection where Jesus actually returns from the dead and he preaches before ascending to the heaven. So let's review. 20 years after his death, we have no writings. Then two decades later, we get them mentioning Jesus in vague terms. 40 years after his death, we get stories of Jesus performing miracles and leaving behind an empty tomb. 55 years after his death, when they were probably next to zero surviving adults from the time of Jesus, we have a much more supernatural story with new miracles, virgin births, and bodily resurrections. The last gospel we get is John. It was written over a period of time being finished probably between 100 and 110 AD. The gospel of John is different from the others. Where the synoptic gospels share a lot of text, John is about 90% unique really new and improved. John also presents the highest level of supernatural claims, or Christology. Scholars consider John as more theological and less historical than the other three. This is where we get the phrases like Lamb of God, Bread of God, Light of the World, and this annoying verse that we see at every football game ever played. So after upwards of 80 years, through an evolution that you can follow using the believer's own letters and books, we end up with this supernatural divine being who is the path and the gatekeeper to eternity. This is exactly, exactly how we'd expect legends to grow. They start simple, perhaps based on a real person. The person becomes lifted above all others and he's made an example. Then it becomes like a big fish story where the fish gets bigger with each telling. If enough decades go by, the story will have totally changed and the characters will no longer be recognizable. If you're still not convinced and you want to argue that there's not enough time for a legend to develop, let me part with a modern example.
This is Menachem Mendel Schneerson, also known as a Lubavitcher Rebbe, or the Rebbe. He was a prominent Hasidic rabbi of the Chabad Lubavitch movement of Orthodox Jews in New York City. Now, some Jews from this sect believe that he is the Jewish Messiah, and they spend all kinds of time promoting him as such. Here's the problem. He died in 1994. So now they believe he will return as the Messiah. But others believe he's merely hidden, meaning he's here, but we just can't see him. And this is actual video footage of these Hasids praying and celebrating with him. That's him in the empty chair. That is today, folks. Right now. But we have the internet and space shuttles and ever-expanding understanding about how the universe works. But this can still happen. And so this is my question to Christians. What makes you so arrogant to think that this could not have happened in primitive and illiterate Palestine? That's right, baby. Boom!